do you remember when you first could name spiritual direction, when you first heard those words or <laughs> claimed that? I'd been doing it quite a while before I named it, knew the name. I began, I was teaching in a secular university before I went to seminary, and uh, I realized with just amazement how my students, many of them Jewish, would trust me with their stories. And this was this very agitated time of student unrest and uh, even violence. And so they would come to office hours and they wanted to know when's the midterm, and then we'd talk about the real things. And I was astonished at their trust in me. And that was one of the things that sent me to seminary, plus a call to work with the dying. That was really what I intended. And when I arrived, um, Alan Jones, who's one of our giants, became my mentor and indeed treated me like a grown-up. And from him I found out, oh, what you've been doing, that's spiritual direction. Oh. And when I was still a student, he would send people to me. And, uh, he was the first person to say you were a spiritual. Yes. This is the charisma or gift that he He sees. was the first person to name it and was very important for me in helping me accept the charism. And it evolved that I did not work directly with the dying. When I stopped my teaching in the secular world, I remember feeling a bit smug the day I taught my last class. I said, oh God, I'm giving this up for you. And I ended up back teaching. Uh, and I realized, well, we're all dying, so I'm still working with the dying. Mm. Interesting. But I had misread the signs. Let me ask you, you've talked so many times about it's all about stories. All about stories. What's the power of stories that when people tell them? Why does that change things? Because our tradition's a story. Our scripture, and I speak now as a Christian, if I knew other traditions, I would know there'd be other stories. That uh, our Bible, including the Hebrew scriptures, it's a great big family album. And then we're part of the story. So we find ourselves in the story and we, to use a good Benedictine word, we ruminate on the stories and just when we think we understand them, we realize, oh no, there's a lot more. And of course, Jesus told stories. I think I wrote somewhere that every time I'm stuck in a really opaque lecture and I'm trying to look very wise, yes, I get it. I picture Jesus coming in and he'd rip out the overhead projector <laughs> and he'd sit down and he'd tell a story and the little kids would get it and the PhDs would get it and anyone who didn't get it probably didn't belong there. It wasn't time. So for me it's always story and when I sit with people I don't have a checklist, you know, tell me now when you were a child, now when you were 12. But we weave the story in and out. Mm. And I always want to know what their experience, their first experience of God was, which was maybe not the first experience of organized religion. But when did God touch them? And sometimes it takes a while to get to that level of trust where you can talk about it. But it's all story. And there's something healing about the, oh. the recollection of the story and the when verbalizing of the story. Name it. When you can name it, very often you can let go of shame. You can move toward reconciliation and letting go of resentment. Maybe not quickly. Now you had a very elegant phrase in Holy Listening. Right. Right. Yeah, you said it's taking out the garbage. Yes. What does that mean? Oh, we carry lots of garbage. And if that's a little coarse, well, we at least clean up the room a little bit and sort out what are we dragging with us that's hurting us, that's keeping us from clarity of vision, that's keeping us from loving others, and even harder, keeping us from accepting love. 
from receiving or accepting love from God or the Holy, the Divine, or anyone. Anyone. And of course, the hardest is receiving love from God. I'm not worthy. We beat ourselves up. But we find, or I find, when we can accept love from others, then it's 10,000 times easier to accept love from God. And to come to that awareness of God as someone who loves us unconditionally. So often in our early upbringing we have the picture of a quite punitive or at least a quite harsh God. And there's one wonderful psalm, a tiny little psalm, in my tradition it's 131. And um, there are the two lines in it, I will still my soul and make it quiet like a child. And that doesn't mean a tiny infant, it means a wiggly, obnoxious toddler. I will still my soul and make it quiet like a toddler on its mother's breast. And that idea of a God that says, well, come sit in my lap and mm -hmm. I'll hold you tight till you get over your meltdown and then we'll talk. When people take on the mantle of these callings, uh, that both sometimes the directees who come and the directors become nice. And <laughs> niceness is not always helpful. Not always. Oh. Is there a place for the confrontational or... I think there is. And remember, to confront is not really hostile. It just means we come face to face. And I may be generalizing. I think sometimes confrontation is more difficult for women because we're socialized to be nice. My greatest comfort is when I've worked with people long enough that we know each other, long enough that they are not projecting a lot onto me. And I can trust them if I say something that really hits them, they will argue with me. Mm -hmm. Then it's, it's easy. But I have to reach a place of mutual trust and then I can do it. I think there's so much patience called for in this ministry. And sometimes those of us sitting in the director's chair can think, oh, we've got this figured out. We know just what's needed here, and we don't. So I am much more able to speak, in the words of the letter to the Ephesians, truth in love, when we have reached that state of mutuality, that what I say can be heard and the person who's listening will know I speak out of love. No desire to shame them or minimize them or somehow get them. But That's it takes the time. That's, the That's where the trust, trust comes. Trust. Yes. So when you had people come to you as directees yes. who had those broken places mm -hmm. and those thin places, how did you connect with that? I've lived long enough to know that we can get broken in many ways. It's not necessarily a loss of faith, but we get, if we live long enough, we get broken in many places. Mm. So indeed, I think brokenness is part of the universal language. And when I knew my work was not to fix it, I could sit with them yes. in the brokenness with no desire to turn them into me. So I think always when one takes one of those steps, when one takes on a new set of vows, whether it's marriage vows or, or joining a religious order or becoming ordained, or even taking on that covenant to raise a child, you let go of something of you. You let go of the old something that needs to be let go.